Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Ahmed Sadiq, and I'm going to talk today about the updates in the field of dermoscopy and trichoscopy. The skin is definitely the largest and heaviest organ of the body. And that's what we see by any naked eye or magnifying glass. But what's going on in deep is actually much more larger than this. There must be lies in the third step of the steps that we climb every day when dealing with any given dermatological case. In the step of visual aid devices and the importance of dermoscopy was initially due to its ability to detect melanomas and skin cancers in an early phase, saving lives. But nowadays, it does much more than this. For preparing this lecture, I've read more than 700 papers that were published in the uh, Medline database, utilizing the PubMed search engine, as you see on the screen. So this has much affected my practice indeed, nailing a proper diagnosis. In spite of many devices that are used in the field and many algorithms that helps us and the introduction of artificial intelligence, which made a great change in the game, still we are going to go for the updates. And definitely we are in the year of the COVID-19 and the first two papers that illustrated how we shall perform the dermoscopy during this era, how we shall perform infection control measures, how we shall take care of our patients, not just while performing dermoscopy, not just while maintaining safe distancing, while using uh, uh, devices that can be uh, applied uh, from a distance to the patient and by keeping all the infection control measures at all times in dealing with the patient. Not just this, but also about teledermoscopy and how it has made benefit to those who have utilized it and it gave good results with high accountability. Not just that, Bloom and Menzies have published a paper on how patients can utilize some non-dermoscopic dermoscopy or dermoscopy dermatoscopeless dermoscopy by utilizing their mobile phones angulated at 45 degrees on the lesion of the skin after putting some immersion fluid, even cooking oil on the lesion. And then they send the paper to the dermatologist, the, the photo to the dermatologist where he shall magnify it and see and give an opinion if possible, minimizing face-to-face -face encounters. And I believe from the images published that yes, these were really impressive. Also, during this time, it was really difficult for some people to get in touch and uh, keep updated. And this paper mentioned that there must be image-based self-learning on computer has really helped a lot in ultra short period. And we're in that era of artificial intelligence and we've been participating in papers on man against machine, but after the machine has beaten experts in dermoscopy in diagnosis of melanoma and certain tumors because the neural network is fed with many images and is really getting smarter and more capable of analyzing data. But still, we have to do this with the other diagnoses because right now, still dermatologists can outbeat the neural network when they have much more details uh, for different lesions. And this is what dermatologists are trained to do. And that's what, uh, what was mentioned in this paper. And I'll start by assessing the papers that were published on behalf of the International Dermoscopy Society. And first, there is this uh, very interesting one on the use of mucoscopy. And it characterized uh, everything we can see over here on the right, a uh, photo of a hemangioma, which is not much different from that seen on the skin. It is an irritated fibroma with some vascular structures and diffuse whitish background. And here is a fixed drug eruption on the lip and you can see the dotted violaceous discoloration over there. Another one was on dermatoscopy of combined blue nevi and it was stated that they definitely lack the melanoma clues, especially the white lines and this is quite accurate. And another one on the differentiation between thin versus thick uh, malignant melanomas and uh, thin melanomas 
showed uh, more dotted blood vessels, more white shiny streaks, and more irregular blue structureless areas than thick melanomas on the breast low scale. Also, the dermoscopic inverse approach really improved the accuracy of human readers for lentigo maligna diagnosis. How is that? The dermoscopic inverse approach is, in Emilio's words, uh, he says that he calls it, who cares? What does who cares mean? It means that if there are no prevalent patterns of benign lesions, then who cares? It's definitely malignant and you have to excise it. So after training doctors for, with clinical and dermoscopic images, the mean sensitivity for the lentigo maligna was without training, almost 50%. After training with pattern analysis, it was not much improved, but after training with the inverse approach or who cares in Emilius words, it got much better. And it even outperformed the convolutional neural network by a big fold. Also for the chondrodermatitis nodularis halysis, dermoscopy revealed, uh, it was published that there is a peculiar daisy pattern that is highly specific in the form of white thick lines, as you see in MHD over there, that are radially arranged, which are converging to a central rounded yellow brown clot, which is form of a serocrust in the center. Also differentiating uh, Articaria from Articaria vasculitis, you see in image one C, this is the pattern of uh, a network-like uh, blood vessels in cases of Articaria, but in Articaria vasculitis, there are more perperic uh, blood uh, uh, areas, uh, red clots over there that are non-blanchable and they take multiple distributions. Back to mucoscopy and for the lip squamous cell carcinoma, it has showed almost the same pattern and structures for the cutaneous squamous skull carcinoma with the presence of multiple polymorphous blood vessels, scales and crusts, and keratinization associated white structures. And for the long-standing dermoscopic rainbow pattern, which was initially thought to be pathognomonic or characteristic for the uh, capricious sarcoma, two papers has been published and yes, it can be seen in many other cases. I've seen it in uh, many hyperkeratinizing uh, conditions as well, even in a case of a mycetoma. That's my experience with that, which uh, augments what's been published that it's not specific for vascular lesions anymore. Also in a case of a lymphangioma, you can see there has been sort of a hyphema-like sign. You see over there with the fluid down in this lobule of the lymphangioma, which creates like a fluid level down there. Also, there must be has been able to help us in assessing tumors of the eyelid uh, margin. And you can see on the left, a BCC with the arborizing blood vessels. And on the right, it's just a dermal nevus. Also, it helped us during the last year in differentiating early from mature clear cell acanthoma based on the abundance of the keratinous stroma due to the degree of acanthosis and the thickened blood vessels seen in later cases or mature cases. Also, what's really very interesting in practice, the differentiation between palmoplantar hyperkeratotic eczema versus the palmoplantar psoriasis. In this image, you can see a case of eczema and you can see the yellowish serocrusts. And if we go to the whole uh, assess assessing uh, findings, the dermoscopic findings, we can see that the uh, patchy distribution in eczema group is higher. Also the abundance of the yellow color and yellow scales is higher in cases of eczema and otherwise for the psoriatic group where the uh, light red uh, background color prevails more than the dull red one that appears in cases of eczema. Also same thing for the hypertrophic scars and keloids. If we can really detect the uh, degree of the vasculature on top, we can predict how uh, will it grow in the near future. Also, the uh, chilblain-like uh, lesions has been assessed and they showed like uh, perperic uh, structures uh, and white uh, scales on their surface. And this one was interesting regarding the gray edged line sign of the scabious burrow. If we go to the image on the right, we can see at higher magnification, 70X magnification, some bluish structures within the uh, burrow of the uh, sarcoptus cabii. And in some burrows, we can detect this line, which is like gray edged line, but actually it's dotted ones. 
And to explain that, we read that paper, which was published by Yuda et al. And they uh, mentioned that this is due to the melanin, which is present in the excreta and fragments of the female sarcoptus cabii. So based on its depth, it will uh, show in either a gray or a bluish color. And this is more dark at the periphery because it's in close proximity to the stratum corneum. Also, there was this detected iceberg sign in actinic keratosis neglecta, where older individuals use toning shampoo for blonde and white hair, and this accumulated on the hyperkeratotic actinic keratosis, giving this iceberg sign. Also, that the most topic features of various stages of lichen planus has been characterized, and in earlier cases, the becomes stry and the blood vessels were more abundant. But when we go to the remitting cases, the abundance of diffuse brown pigmentation is more than the presence of the becomes stry and the vascular structures, which is quite lucky. Also, this was interesting regarding the lesions of the epidermodysplasia verruciformis. And if we go to the three images of the left on the wart like lesions, it's been decided that uh, they look uh, hypopigmented with ill focused dotted blood vessels. But for the versicolor like lesions, they show more erythema, they show more scales, even some dotted blood vessels as well. Also for the terra firma form dermatosis, uh, three patterns have been characterized, either polygonal brown clots arranged in a mosaic pattern, perifollicular hyperpigmentation, or even sepke-like pattern, as you see in the image. Here you see on the right, the perifollicular pattern, and on the left, the diffuse appearance of the dark color. Also for the sebaceous carcinoma, and it was stated that it's pretty much like the squamous cell carcinoma with the difference of having much more yellow structureless areas and yellow clods because of the sebaceous component for sure. And this was interesting because the use of ultraviolet dermoscopy gave fluorescence for the demodex mite on the face of a rosacea patient. Also, it gave the same thing on the teeth of a congenital erythropoietic porphyria patient, but this was just polarized without even the use of ultraviolet 405 nanometer light, near ultraviolet, which is also used in here to better visualize the melanin distribution in cutaneous melanoma. Also, dermoscopy and trichoscopy can be used to differentiate erythroderma due to various dermatological disorders like seborrheic dermatitis, atopic dermatitis, Caesarey syndrome, and uh, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma as well. And almost the findings that are seen on the scalp are those seen on the skin with more brownish discoloration, which favors the cases of Caesarey syndrome, and more orange discoloration in the background, which favors the cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. Mm -hmm. And this was just the start. It was also published on how the hair is affected. And it was found that in case of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, there are numerous affections of the hair shaft in the form of pilotorty and visible anagen bulbs with also numerous broken hairs, which is not the case for other so cases of uh, 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 erythroderma. And the one really interesting thing was the everlasting haunt for uh, getting proper quantitative trichoscopy and the introduction of follicular map is really promising where by uh, using high quality, uh, high definition 70X uh, magnification power of video trichoscopy, we can really detect the appearance of the hairs and we can know exactly uh, the, which part of it in the uh, individual scalp, which uh, shows no repetition over the scalp of any given individual and in between other individuals. And if you can't go for that, you can simply go for some ink, which will highlight the follicular ostia. Also using the uh, panoramic uh, photo uh, shooting uh, option of the mobile phones attached to a dermatoscope or a trichoscope can really help a lot in uh, getting better recognition of a larger field and saving multiple shots and uh, increasing the accuracy of assessment of skin lesions, even the frontal hairline. Pressure induced alopecia shall be diagnosed by the presence of thin hairs, and this shall be a clue for diagnosis, and it usually heals afterwards. 
Also, the fuse variants of scalp like and planopilaris were studied, and you can see two images, the one on the right with severe inflammatory component, the one on the left with less inflammatory component, and the difference has been characterized because in cases of uh, the uh, pattern the distribution and in cases of the diffuse like in planopilaris, there is more follicular erythema, which is absent in the cicatricial pattern hair loss, which is just diffuse. Same thing lies for the perifollicular hyperkeratosis, and this is uh, based on the pathological degree of inflammation that occurs on those different subtypes. Also, there has been reports that there is occipital hairline involvement in cases of frontal fibrosing alopecia as well. So will it be still called frontal fibrosing alopecia or the term will be uh, changed in the near future? We will see. Also, trichoscopy has been used for a very really long time for uh, as a diagnostic tool for tinea capitis. And uh, it has been also stated that it can differentiate whether uh, which type of tinea capitis we are dealing with based on the type of affection of the hair shafts. And uh, a systemat another systematic review for that stated that if we are dealing with a case of microsporum infection, we can see more morsecode-like hairs, zigzag hairs, bent hairs, and diffuse scaling. But in case of trichophyton infection, we can see more of corkscrew hairs. And based on that, we can start treatment. And after four weeks, we can reassess. And after 12 weeks, we can also reassess. And you see here in this table, the list of the findings and the uh, p-value. There has been also invented an activity scale for cases of folliculitis decalvans, where the yellow signs in the form of uh, follicular pustules, yellow tubular scaling, and yellow crust means that we are uh, having a severe activity. And these are characterized by this uh, score, plus two, plus one, and plus one. But the red signs show that it's a milder case. Porelia follicular erythema takes plus one, perifollicular hemorrhage plus one, and thin arising vessels minus one. So the higher the score means that there is a flare up of uh, folliculitis, the Calvin's case. Also, there has been an association of the activity between uh, trichoscopy and clinical activity in cases of alopecia areata and definitely uh, trichoscopy can detect activity more than just clinical assessment. And based on that has been created an alopecia areata predictive score where the negative predictor, uh, predictive markers for hairy growth taking the score of minus one are the presence of black dots, broken hairs, exclamation mark hairs, and tapered hairs. And the positive predictive markers for hair regrowth taking the score of plus one are the upright regrowing hairs and the pigtail hairs. And based on that, we can get a score ranging from two till minus four. And this is that we can go for the treatment after, uh, after we diagnose the case and reassess after two months from initiating the treatment and get a probability of hair regrowth based on the score that we calculate. Also, there has been this nice paper on a subtype of alopecia areata, which is the self-healing acute diffuse and total alopecia, which occurs mainly in females and shows the signs of alopecia areata. And the authors have published on 14 cases, you can see in the bottom of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the slide, the mild cases and the spontaneous regression. And you can see on top the severe type with the spontaneous regression as well. And based on that also has been created an algorithm in order to be able to assess the case. And if needed, we can go with corticosteroid pulse therapy, systemic steroid, or contact immunotherapy as the case of alopecia areat. Also, there has been published this uh, sign, which is called the Flambeau sign, which is a characteristic of tractional alopecia, where we can see here the perifollicular scale extended by this white track, with which they resembled by a light torch. That's why it was called the Flambeau sign. And finally, the bubble hair and the usefulness of trichoscopy, because some females, they while they use the use of uh, heat therapy for hair, especially while uh, not what not dry, uh, co complain of hair loss. But actually, it's just hair breakage due to the accumulation of hair bubbles in the hair shaft. And finally, the trichofliculoma, which has been compared to a troll hair like dermoscopy over there due to the tufting of white vellus hair uh, from the tumor. 
If you'd like to know more, you can go to the uh, International Dermoscopy Society website and you can be a member for free, www.dermoscopy-ids.org, where you can find many teaching resources over there. And don't forget to join us for the Virtual World Co uh, Congress of Dermoscopy, which will be held next June. Hope you enjoyed the meeting and thank you. <laughs>